Welcome back to RipeWave Audio Channel, where we explore all types of home audio systems from hi-fi to home theater. My name is John, and in this session, we will see how cinema surround sound has evolved over a 80-year period to the immersive sound formats we have today. While this channel is focused on home solutions, knowing how cinema applications of surround sound have evolved enables us to better understand the theater environments we are trying to emulate at home. Even the earliest incarnations of surround sound, beginning with the Bell Labs developments of the 1930s, aimed at bringing more realism and impact to the theater experience. With this tour, we see how the cost of multi-channel film technology impeded its widespread adoption until the right balance was achieved in the 1970s with Dolby Stereo. While we may look at the recent expansion of speakers used in home theater setups from 5, 7, 9, 11 or more, as something new, and to some a bit extreme, Disney employed 90 speakers in the first cinema surround sound deployments 80 years ago in 1940. This system had three discrete channels driven by 106 watt amplifiers for each of the towering 12 speaker arrays placed left right and center behind the screen. 54 additional house speakers were placed on the sides and rear of the theater. This system was called Fantasound. With Mark 9 of Fantasound, two sets of rear speakers were used and the sound from the left and right speakers could be diverted or complemented by manually switching the signal on cue to the rear house speakers. With Mark 10, surround switching and level changes were handled automatically, controlled by a therathon and mechanical notches on the film. A road show to 13 theaters across the United States between 1940 and 1941 was used to debut Fantasia, using this sound system at high cost, as theaters had to be shut down while they were converted. The tour was not profitable. Uh, that, combined with the beginning of World War II, put an end to Fantasound. Fantasia would be broadly distributed in mono, as with all other motion pictures until 1950s. With the advent of television, the motion picture industry was looking for ways to drive audiences back to the cinema. They saw enhancing the experience with widescreen and surround sound as the answer. The first who arrived was Cinerama in 1952 with the release, This is Cinerama. Beginning in black and white, and an aspect ratio of 4.3, when the words, this is Cinerama, came on, the screen expanded to a full 2.65 by 1 aspect ratio in color and was illuminated by three 35 millimeter projectors on deeply curved screens. The sound complemented the widescreen with its seven discrete audio channels. While this system had the left, right, and center channels, as with Fantasound, center left and center right were added for a total of five speakers behind the screen, providing realistic panning of sound across the wide screen. There are also separate left and right surrounds for localization across the back. The sound was carried for the first time on 35 millimeter magnetic film tracks synchronized with the three projectors. Cinemascope was next to arrive on the scene a, a year later, 
CinemaScope also employed a wide screen. This screen was able to achieve a 2.66 by 1 aspect ratio using a sig single 35mm projector and an anamorphic process. While CinemaScope had surround sound, it was not as elaborate as the one supplied by Cinerama. To save costs, magnetic audio tracks were added to the edge of the films on either side of each perforation, producing four discrete audio tracks for three front and one surround channel. As this was a multi-channel film format where the audio tracks did not require a separate film, it was less expensive to distribute, with cost being a factor, over 20 times more features were released using CinemaScope versus Cinerama. Todd A.O. took a different approach to widescreen films. Here a 70 millimeter film was used to achieve a higher resolution with a 2.3 to 1 aspect ratio using a single projector as with CinemaScope, but without the need for the anamorphic process. While slightly curved screens were first used, and two films used deeply curved screens, most Todd AO films adopted the standard flat widescreen presentation. Given the 70mm film size, six magnetic audio tracks could be added in a similar manner as with CinemaScope using the film edges, but with an extra track added to each of the far edges. As the 70 millimeter film is more expensive format, its adoption rate was closer to that of Cinerama at 23 films. Todd AO had only one surround channel, but possesses the same five channel array up front as Cinerama. While comparatively, only a small number of Todd AO films were made, many received Academy Award nominations or awards, including the first Todd AO production, Oklahoma, as well as the Academy Award for sound winning films, South Pacific and The Sound of Music. Despite the renewed interest in movie technology in the 1950s, Hollywood continued to produce the majority of its films in mono. Furthermore, the Academy curve continued to be the noise reduction solution for all films. The Academy curve was put into practice in the 1930s to address poor sound characteristics of most theaters, which experienced hiss and had limited ability to reproduce low frequencies. While better theaters existed and could support wider frequency ranges, the Academy curve set a flat response between 100 Hz and 1.6 kHz with a steep drop on each end it had to be applied regardless. This all changed with the arrival of Dolby A noise reduction, which could, be, which could remove noise without the application of the Academy curve starting in 1971 with the release of the film Clockwork Orange and more widespread use after 1974. With the use of Dolby in place, the X-curve was developed in 1975, which could then be used for equalization of room characteristics rather than for noise reduction. Given that films with optical audio tracks were more cost effective, the technology was not being displaced by magnetic tracks. Splitting the optical track in two was not considered before Dolby A as the sound quality would be lowered. However, with Dolby applied, two optical tracks could be used in the same film space with fidelity. The remaining challenge was the lack of a center channel 
which had been present on all cinema surround formats, including Disney's Fantasound in 1940. To solve the center channel problem, Kodak teamed up with Dolby. Dolby decided to directionally enhance the matrix technology being used in quadraphonic audio recordings. This resulted in a four-channel solution that no, not only added a center channel, but delivered a surround channel matrix into the optical two tracks of audio and was first demonstrated with the release of 1976's A Star is Born and was marketed as Dolby Stereo. Now, the excitement for the new Dolby Stereo format didn't take off until the release of Star Wars a year later in 1977. With Star Wars, audiences really became aware of what surround sound could deliver as part of a film's experience. Finally, all the elements had lined up. 35 mil millimeter film was low cost due to its optical audio track and, be, and could be used without a large investment by theater owners and were more durable than magnetic tracks. Furthermore, the sound quality was now clean with the presence of noise reduction. As a result, over 12,000 films have been made using Dolby Stereo as the primary or backup soundtrack. While Dolby Stereo was the answer for mass distribution on 35 millimeter film, Dolby would bring its noise reduction technology to the 70 millimeter high resolution widescreen market. As introduced by Todd A.O., 70 millimeter was capable of six magnetic audio tracks and did not require the matrix approach as Dolby Stereo applied to 35 millimeter films, but could benefit from Dolby A noise reduction. However, Dolby would reassign the track utilization, abandoning the center left and center right channels of Todd AO in favor of two baby boom tracks, which we now today call low frequency effects or LFE for short. This would be the first time a dedicated subwoofer output would be introduced as a discrete channel. For the early releases, the 70 millimeter six track Dolby stereo releases, as they were promoted as, had discrete left and right LFE channels. Something not present in today's formats either cinema or home theater. 1976's Logan Run was the first movie in this format. With the release of Superman in 1978, sound engineers decided to reassign the second Baby Boom track to split the surround track into discrete left and right channels for a speaker configuration we know today as 5.1 surround sound. This 70 millimeter analog format survived for many years with 250 films produced. In the 1980s, Dolby faced competition from Ultra Stereo, which offered the same matrix style approach on 35 millimeter film, but was not nearly as successful. George Lucas introduced THX in 1983. Now, this was not a new format, but rather a set of reproduction standards for theaters so they could, um, so the sound performance levels could be consistently achieved. Dolby enhanced the 70 millimeter films in 86 and 35 millimeter films in 87 with improved noise reduction they called Dolby Stereo SR, spectral recording but did not introduce any new surround sound features until the next decade. The 1990s ushered in the age of digital surround sound in film. 
The first offering was from Kodak called Cinema Digital Sound, which replaced the analog soundtrack with a digital one using 4 to 1 compression and could be applied to both 35mm and 70mm film prints. This digital soundtrack had six discrete channels and a standard 5.1 configuration. The Cinema Digital Sound format would lay the ground for Dolby's own digital format, Dolby Digital, which used the AC3 codec. Dolby Digital took the approach that the AC3 codec could apply the compression levels up to 15 to 1 without audible detection. Compression is necessary to fit the required digital data onto the allocated film print space for the six audio tracks. Dolby Digital has been the most successful surround format to date, approaching 20,000 films released since 1992. In 1993, Dolby would see competition from DTS and Sony in the digital domain. The good thing is all three digital surround formats are supported by a single film reel, which also has a backup analog optical print keeping distribution costs low. The Dolby digital print occupies the space between the sprocket holes. Sony's entry was called SDDS, meaning Sony Dynamic Digital Sound. This format reintroduced the five channel front stage and had a five to one compression ratio and a sound quality similar to that of Dolby Digital. Two copies of the SDDS digital Im image are placed on the outer edges of the film. DTS, or Digital Theater Systems, enter the market with the aim of delivering a higher quality audio program. Like Dolby Digital, DTS is a 5.1 configuration. Compression is set at 4 to 1. The main difference is the bit rate, which is much higher than either SDDS or Dolby Digital at 882 kilobytes per second. Rather than including the DTS soundtrack on the film, they supplied a separate CD-ROM and synchronized that to the film using the DTS timecode image next to the analog track. Having the DTS soundtrack on CD-ROM enabled the higher bit rate and resulting audio quality advantage over the competing formats. As the 90s closed, Sony ceased SSDS uh, releases. In 1999, both Dolby and DTS enhanced their offerings. Star Wars Episode I, The Phantom Menace, was released with support for both of these new standards. Dolby's entry was Dolby Digital Surround EX. EX built on the same AC3 codecs used by Dolby Digital, for its compression and bitrate, but provided an additional matrix rear surround channel. This seven channel configuration has become known as 6.1. Similarly, DTS-ES, or extended surround, is also a 6.1 configuration with a matrix rear surround channel. DTS-ES shares the same audio quality advantages over Dolby and its predecessor, DTS. Compared to the 5.1 formats, Dolby Digital EX and DTS ES only have a few releases natively with 6.1. The next advancement in cinema sound would come with Dolby Surround 7.1. As the name suggests, this is an 8-channel format. While Digital Dolby EX supported one matrix rear surround, Dolby Surround 7.1 added two additional discrete channels for the rear speakers. As with DTS-ES, the Dolby Digital EX format, Dolby Digital 7.1 has been used sparingly. As streaming services bring a raft of new content to the home market, the film industry, once again, looks to create new experiences not achievable at home 
to draw audiences back to the cinema. The immersive experience they are creating combines highest levels of image quality with sounds that can be used to pinpoint in space objects in all direction. To accomplish this level of sound location, sound technology has been developed that uses objects and positions to locate sounds versus discrete speaker outputs. Using objects, it is possible to design speaker configurations that are only limited by the surround processor and the budget for speakers and not by the material supplied on the film. Dolby arrived with an immersive system called Dolby Atmos as part of the first wave of object-based solutions. It builds on 5.1 and 7.1 deployments already in theaters and can support 64 speaker feeds, including the use of ceiling-mounted speakers. Disney's Brave was the first release with Dolby Atmos in 2012. Oral 11.1 is a 12-speaker configuration of the Barco Oral 3D technology and was launched the same year as Dolby Atmos. Oral uses multiple layers of sound fields with more emphasis on the use of height speakers than ceiling speakers and challenges the Dolby approach. DTS-X was introduced in 2013 and currently has the lowest film adoption. DTS-X is designed without a speaker configuration to find. DTS is compatible with Oral 11.1 and Dolby Atmos speaker configurations as well as 5.1 and 7.1 setups. While both Dolby and Oral 3D limit objects to 128 per scene, the DTS-X specification does not place a limit on objects. Like the premium surround sound formats of the 1940s and 50s, theaters designed for Atmos, Oral, and DTS-X are harder to find, and the moviegoer is going to have to pay a premium for the enhanced technology. It will be interesting to see how these new immersive formats will enjoy more or less success than Cinerama, Cinemascope, and Todd AO. Looking at these multi-channel cinema surround formats on one page is fascinating as we look to emulate the cinema experience at home. Here are the trends which I have observed. So we have four major advancement in cinema surround sound. First, we had the age of discrete analog between 1940 and 1975. The second era is the age of Dolby noise reduction and matrix surround between 1976 and 1989. The third age is the digital age between 1990 and 2011. And now we find ourselves in the immersive age starting in 2012. All of the multi-channel film formats support a minimum, minimum of three front channels. This is interesting. They all support at least three front channels. So that is to say they all have a center channel and aligns with what many people say is the center channel is very important even for home applications. And all of the multi-channel film formats have a surround channel of some form. Now since the LFE channel was introduced in 1976 for 70 millimeter and in 1990 for 35 millimeter films, each surround format has continued to support an LFE channel. This suggests the importance of having that LFE channel uh, as part of a home system as well. Now, the localized surround seems to be more preferred over localized LFE uh, because the two-channel 
LFE uh, did not last long uh, and was quickly replaced in favor of the uh, left and right surround channels. Now the use of the digital Dolby, the Dolby Digital 5.1 format, as I said before, is by far, far the most widely adopted surround format to date. Therefore, um, this, should, this format, the 5.1 Dolby Digital format, should serve as a good basis for anyone looking to build a home theater system. In fact, some people say that um, it gives you the most bang for your buck. When you start going to more channels, uh, while the, your, your experience can improve, it's not as dramatic of an of a increase. Now, solutions have been used for noise reduction, matrixing of the channels, and digital compression. So these solutions that do these things, they either solutions that either reduce noise, matrix channels, or add compression to digital are designed to compensate for sound quality, um, availability of film space, or costs. Now as technology evolves, the choices become easier with less compromise and result in an overall improvement in experience. And then finally, it appears that sound quality and cost impacts adoption rate more positively than the quantity of speakers used. So there you have it. 80 years of cinema surround on one page. In future videos, we will explore home formats and refer back to this summary. If you enjoyed this video and are interested in enhancing your audio experience, please like and subscribe to this RipeWave audio channel and be sure to select the bell icon so you'll be notified as soon as the next video is posted. Until then, keep evolving your audio experience.